All right, I want to do a quick recap before we get into today's message. Okay, during his earthly ministry, Jesus did, uh, touched and transformed countless lives. Like other events in the life of Jesus, his miracles were documented by eyewitnesses. Okay, this is not secondhand stuff. This is eyewitnesses. The four Gospels record 37 miracles that Jesus performed, with Mark the, Mark's Gospel recording the most. Interestingly enough, Mark's Gospel is the shortest, and it records the most miracles. Um, in the closing verses of John's Gospel, it states this, in John chapter 21, Jesus did so many th- other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. So Jesus transformed uh, miracles from several, he performed miracles for several reasons. First, the miracles of Jesus demonstrate and prove that he is the Messiah and Son of God that we should believe in Jesus. John 20, 30 says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The second reason Jesus did miracles, Jesus' miracles also provided confirmation of his message about the kingdom of God. Matthew 11, 2-5 tells us how Jesus responds to John the Baptist, right? He says uh, in 11, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one to come or should we wait for another? Jesus answered him, Go and tell John what you have heard and seen. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. Now, a third reason for the miracles is the the signs and wonders of Jesus testify of his limitless compassion for people and his long 14 when Jesus was set free from bondage. Okay? Matthew 14, 14. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowds, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Remember we talked about, I mean, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When you see Jesus do something, or you see the heart of Jesus moved in a particular way in the Gospels, you know that that's his heart for today. Now, the interesting thing about the heart of Jesus for today is that it's supposed to be beating in our chests. We're supposed to have the same compassion for people that Jesus did. The ministry, information, uh, the ministry of Information was formed by the British government as a dep- uh, department responsible for publicly, publicity and propaganda during World War II in the late 1939s. After the outbreak of the war, the MOI was appointed by the British government to design a number of morale-boosting posters that would disp- that be displayed across the British Isles during the te- testing times that laid ahead. These posters, there were three in all, were to be posted on public transport. They looked something like that. You ever seen that Keep Common Carry On? It's very trendy now. Okay, but it, it came about during World War II, and it was to be posted. Um, it was to be posted on public transport, in shop windows, on notice boards, and signposts across Britain. The third and final poster of the set was very straightforward and to the point. It simply read, keep calm and carry on. The plan in place for this poster was to, issue an only, was to be issued only upon a successful invasion of Germany into Britain. Which you, we all know, right? Please tell me you know that that didn't happen. Okay. Um, it didn't happen. The, Brit, uh, the Brits were able to repel the Germans, and it never, so this poster never got put up. It wasn't until early 2000s that it was found in a bookstore, and it was 
put in, a, in the store window. It got a lot of publicity. But it was, most of them were recycled. They're just gone. It never got used. But now it kind of epitomizes the resilience and the stalwartness of the British people. It's all over the place. I mean, there's T-shirts. I mean, the poor, one of the guys like, um, copyrighted it. And he's, he's got, I don't know how you copyright something that the British government did, but he's doing it. And it's a big controversy over there about whose rights this is and all that. It's just like one of those things. But uh, for the sake of this message today, I want to change it just a little bit. Okay, it's going to look more like this. Keep calm and walk on. Keep calm and walk on. Okay, so keep that in your mind. That's the title of the message. Keep calm and walk on. The big idea of this message is this. Jesus displays his divine power over nature by calming a storm and bringing peace to a dire situation for his disciples. Keep calm. We're going to talk about that part first. First, let's focus on, we're going to talk about two different passages today. We're going to talk about Mark chapter 4, and then we're going to talk about Matthew chapter 14, which was represented for you in, in full living color on the wall. Okay, that was the story of Jesus walking on the water. Let's, let's, let's focus on Mark 4 first. So turn to Mark 4, chapter 35 through 41. Mark 4, 35 through 31. And it says this, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with, uh, with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep, on a cushion, I've had weeks like that where you could blow up, you know, an air horn in my ear and I'm not going to wake up. I've had weeks like that. And that's just, I think that's really interesting. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Put a pin on that spot, okay? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Keep calm. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this? that even the winds and the seas obey him? That's an interesting question. I think it would be pretty apparent. Sin and, uh, the seas and the wind obey kind of points to one particular individual. But you have to understand, they're not looking for that individual. They're looking for the Messiah, not the Messiah. They're looking for a King David type. There was no indication in the first century mind that the Messiah would be the Messiah they got. I mean, there's, it's in there. It's in the Old Testament. It's there. But in the first century mind, they were not looking for a miracle-working, storm-stopping, wind-ceasing Messiah. They were looking for a king to overthrow the Romans. So... It's, it's, it's just an interesting concept when you start thinking about, um, we, we give them a lot of grief, these disciples, because, and Jesus actually did too, but, you know, we, what, he's, what, he's calmed the storm. Who do you think he is? Well, unfortunately, they don't have the benefit of having read the New Testament. They're living it. And I'm sure it was very bothersome. I mean, honestly, that's spooky. A guy gets up in the boat. I mean, even if you think he's the Messiah, you didn't expect that. He goes, hey, chill out. <laughs> I'd be a little scared, too. I'd be like, who, in, who is this guy? We weren't expecting this. We weren't expecting this. 
as cool as it is and as maybe as excited as they were to see it, they weren't expecting that. But I think we have to understand here that I think we have the same mind as the disciples often. We underestimate Jesus. We underestimate him. We think he can do this, but we, we would never expect him to do that. So we don't even know that. We don't even ask for it. I think Jesus likes to show off a little bit. I think he likes people to see his power, his glory. You know why? Because it brings him glory. And that's kind of what the whole deal is. So I think we have to start thinking along those lines of like, maybe, we, maybe we're just being pathetic with our understanding of who he is and how much he cares and what his power is. So we'll just dive into this a little bit, and then we'll move on. Jesus had been teaching and ministering to large crowds throughout the day. When evening came, Jesus decided to leave the crowds of people by taking several boats to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. During the trip, Jesus fell asleep. I love that. It makes me feel good that even Jesus got whooped. It does. It makes me feel good. It shows the fact that he is 100% human and 100% God. He needed some sleep. I was talking to my pastor, a prayer group this Friday, and um, we were just talking about, you know, when we talk in the pastor prayer group, it's supposed to be a prayer group, but it ends up being like discussion time and then, oh, man, we got to pray, you know. Um, I'm sure you've been in a group like that, too, once in a while. But, uh, you know, every church has its struggles, and I, and I feel like myself, personally, uh, when, when ministry really hits, it, it's amplified. It may be even ra- irrationally amplified when I'm tired. So I was reading in my devotion the other day about Elijah. And he just had this huge victory on Mark Carmel. He, I mean, he, he, his arm probably fell off with how many guys he killed. I mean, you know. It was, a, it was a huge victory. It was pretty brutal, actually. And then Jezebel gets mad at him, starts throwing a hissy fit, and he starts, he panics. This is the guy who just saw fire come down from heaven, prayed, and the drought ended, and a little old queen gets mad at him, and he has, like, a breakdown. So what he does is he runs away. He just called down fire from heaven. And he's running with his tail between his legs. What happens? He finds a bush to lay under. And he sleeps. Falls asleep. A little later on, he's woken by the angel. Who brings him food? He eats the food. And after that, he goes to sleep. You think, oh, no, he's going to. And then he wakes up again, and he eats more food. He gets fueled up. And then God sends him on a 40-day fast into the wilderness. And God, God, God says, I am going to get out of this cave. He's in the Mount Sinai area. He goes, he's in a cave. I'm, I'm way off my notes, so here we go. Um, he's in this cave. And God says, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass by you. Now, this is, doesn't happen. So he goes outside the, outside the cave and lightning, fire, earthquake, all these things. And he's, he's freaking out. And he says, God, but he realized that God was not in any of those things. Then he heard the still, small, caring voice of God. And God was in the still voice. When we get overwhelmed, and we get tired. Things are irrationally worse. We need, to, we need to remove ourselves sometimes from the situation and get some sleep. Eat some comfort food. Go crazy on a bacon mac and cheese. Just go for it. You can work the calories off later, but right now you need some where in the world am I in this? Okay. Um, Jesus liked mac and cheese. No. Um, 
<laughs> it's a holy food. It's like manna. That's what manna was, mac and cheese from the sky. No, um, with bacon. Yeah, I know the Jews and bacon. No. Uh, so even Jesus needed to rest. I think that's a good word for us today. We are in what we call the rat race. Sometimes we need to back off. And it doesn't always have to be, you know, well, I'm in the rat race, so I need to get back, and I really need to study God's word. Maybe that's not restful at that moment. Maybe you just need to sleep. Maybe you just need to eat some good food and then go back to sleep. Some of us sleep too much, but whatever. Here we go. So even Jesus needed to rest. As the boats were crossing, a severe storm arose. Mark describes it as a furious squall. Now here's some little interesting tidbit about that. The storm can be described in the following way, based on the amount, uh, the account of, of Luke's gospel, Luke says the storm came down, showing that the storm fell suddenly from Mount Hermon in the north, down the Jordan Valley, and slams into the Sea of Galilee um, in a violent way at the depths of 682 feet below sea level. Okay, this is a thing that happens in that area. These storms come down, cold air comes down, hits the moist air from below sea level, and just, whoom, these storms pop up real big. It happens. It's a sudden storm. The intensity of the storm is uh, communicated to the reader. The waves were so large that they were breaking, uh, they're breaking into the boat and filling it with water. And these disciples, listen, these disciples were fishermen. This was their life. And they were afraid, of their, afraid, afraid for their lives. That's how bad it was. And Jesus is just snoozing away. He's just chilling. He probably was that whooped. Um, so, what happens at this moment? They awoke Jesus. And they said something very, very interesting. And I want to ask you this question. I want, to, I want to see if this is something that may relate to you. They asked Jesus the question, don't you care that we are drowning? Don't you care? I've had that moment. Am I the only one here? Have you ever had that moment? God, don't you care? Jesus doesn't even answer them. He just gets up and does what only Jesus can do. He says, be quiet and still. And then he looks to them and he's like, why are you so afraid? Why are we so afraid? Why? Jesus is in the boat with us. Why are we so afraid? We are so afraid because we don't really believe that he's the Messiah that we need. We always think he's the Messiah that we want. We're expecting a different Messiah. When he's saying, no, I'm not about that. I'm about this. I do care. I love you. You don't even know how much I love you. Where is your faith? We get so, hey, I'm in the boat with you guys. We get in that situation where we're like, Jesus, don't you even care? I feel, like I'm being, I feel like I'm being swamped here. I feel like I'm drowning. Don't you care? Jesus is like, it ain't no thing to me. <laughs> I just get up from my sleep and I, it's all, I do care. Where's your faith? What is your faith in? Now, they did not expect that to happen. I really kind of feel like they were expecting them to grab an oar or a bucket. I, that's what I really do. I don't, I don't think that they were going, Jesus, can you please calm this storm? It's getting a little rough out here. They were like, Jesus, don't you get, get a bucket? What are you doing? Why are you sleeping? We're going to die. And he's like, ah, I want to go back to bed. Peace be still. <laughs> don't you know? Where is your faith? I'm asking you that question today. Where is your faith? Why do we get so concerned about the storms of life? Yeah, they come, but Jesus is in the boat with us. And the, 
we ask the, yeah, we ask the question, do you care? And he doesn't even, he, he shouldn't even have to answer that question. Because he is the Messiah. He does care. His actions prove it in this story. Suddenly the wind ceased and a great calm came over the water. And then they ask an interesting question. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? The question the disciples asked one another is a vital question for us today. Who is this? Even though the disciples had seen Jesus perform many miracles before this point, which is probably why he was so whooped. I mean, he just spent day and night ministering to people. They saw this. The disciples still didn't know exactly who Jesus is. Psalms 107. He is no mere man. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storms to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. It's all the way back in Psalms. Nothing is too big for God. You got to remember, you got to, you know how we talked about earlier, the same Jesus that did these miracles is the same Jesus today? But he's also the same Jesus that was the word that spoke wind and rain and into existence in the first place. He never changes. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Without him, there's no wind or rain or storms or anything. He's got that power. We forget that and we get afraid. So keep calm. Keep calm. And walk on. Matthew 14. Matthew 14. If we look at the story of Jesus walking on the water as we did earlier, okay, we see similarities in the narrative. Interestingly enough, Jesus is ministering all day. He just fed the 5,000. Now, I don't know what kind of energy is exerted in that kind of a miracle. I don't know. But he was, I just know that being with people for long periods of time, large groups of people, is fatiguing. And he's talking and teaching the entire time, which is also fatiguing. So Jesus needs a break every once in a while, but this time, he feels the need not to sleep, but to go and be with his father and get ministered to. So he sends the crowds away. He goes up on a mountain. He sends the disciples across this, the uh, Sea of Galilee to the other side. He says, I'll meet you there. I don't, I don't know if there was a discussion around that as to, like, how are you going to get there? If we have the boat, it's like, the, it's like that, the thing that goes on with the car in the morning. If I have the car... And I got all the car seats in the car. How are you going to get the kids? You know, that whole thing. I don't know if that discussion was had, but uh, after feeding the 5,000, I think they were just like, whatever, Jesus. You're going to get there? I believe you're going to get there, you know? Jesus goes up on the mountain, and he prays. And then while he's praying, one of these storms rises again. Now, I have to believe that there's some level of malefic maleficent, maleficent, malevolence. Ha. Malevolence in these storms. They're too convenient. And they're too scary. These guys are fishermen. You know what I mean? They're fishermen. All of a sudden, they're finding themselves out in the Sea of Galilee all the time and almost dying. But for whatever reason, whether it be natural or supernatural, the storm hits again, and it's the same type of storm. Super, super intense. And they're bailing out. They're trying to figure out where they are. And Jesus says that Jesus sees this happening from the mountain, and he goes down to them. And he comes walking on the water. And they're like, what is that? 
Is that a ghost? Those idiots. It's obviously Jesus. Remember, they didn't read the New Testament. They didn't read it. And the fact of the matter is, no one in the history of the world has walked on water to this point. So yeah, I might come to a conclusion that it's other than somebody walking on water. Give them a break, for Pete's sake. But for some reason, Jesus is out there. What, what did that feel like? I was listening to somebody a little while back in preparation for this. He's like, he's like it, it sounded so like neat and clean. Like Jesus has the ability to line up his molecular structure <laughs> with the structure of the molecules of the water. I'm like, did you test that? Did you, you know, take samples? I mean, what? how do you know that? <laughs> I just think he's God, you know, so that's kind of all I really need to... Molecular structure, I don't know, whatever, you know. But <laughs> maybe there was fish underneath him. He's just walking on the fish, you know. <laughs> kind of like Aquaman. Just a, whoa. <laughs> yeah, right? It could. Hey, you never know, right? <laughs> so P- Peter, Peter's uh, in the boat, and he sees Jesus, and he recognizes Jesus for who he is. Even though this is impossible, he's starting to learn that Jesus has a tendency to do things that are impossible, like dividing fish and loaves to feed 5,000 people, raising people from the dead. These are kind of impossible things that Jesus is just doing on a routine basis. And I love this. Peter gets such a bad rep so much. You know, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter... Peter, Peter. But he's only one of two people in the entire history of the world that has walked on water. And when he sees Jesus, he says, that's cool, I want to do that too. And he has this idea in his head that's insane. He says, Lord, call to me. So he's saying, what Jesus is able to do When Jesus calls me to it, I can do it too. And he says, he says, call to me to come out to you. He doesn't say, oh, apparently there's hard water. He doesn't just like get out of the boat and like, okay, cool, anybody can do this. He knows that this is not normal. But he has the realization and the idea that if Jesus is able to do it, if he calls me to do it, I can then follow his lead. I can do it too. That is a sermon in itself, folks. Okay, if Jesus is able to do it and he calls us to do it, we should have the confidence in believing by faith that we can do what he calls us to do. It wasn't Peter's power that allowed him to line up his molecules. It was Peter's reliance on God. Now, here's the thing. Peter gets out and he's actually doing it. He's actually doing it. He's walking on water. Be cool, wouldn't it, Nick? Yeah, I looked at that too. And he does a very human thing. So we need to cut Peter some slack again. He does a very human thing. He takes his focus off of Jesus, and he starts to look at the, the things that are going on, swirling on, the danger swirling all around him, the, the, the tumult that is going on around him, the, the, the swirling storm that is around He takes his focus off the only one that is allowing him to do the impossible. And he puts it on the circumstances that he finds himself in. And what does he do? He does, every, he does the same thing that each and every one of us do when we take our focus off Christ. He begins to sink. He begins to sink. And you've been there. I've been there. We take our focus off the one who allows us to be and do the things that he has called us to, and we start looking at the problems of the situations that we're in, and we drown in it. The cool thing is, Jesus is right there to lift us up. There's a great picture out there. I wish I had put it up there. It's a great picture. It's from a perspective of Peter under the water. 
and it shows Jesus' sandals in his hand reaching down. I love, it's such a cool picture. You can find it on Google. Just Google it. It's cool. But the concept is this. When we take our focus off of the miracle working Jesus, the natural is very overwhelming. It is. We've all been there. But when we keep our focus on Christ, we can walk on the water. We can walk over the tumultuous circumstances that we're in. So Jesus might calm the storm in your life. He might give you the ability to walk on it, walk over it. And you're never going to know which one Jesus is because it doesn't. So here's the thing. It doesn't matter what Jesus does. It matters where our focus lies. If our focus is on Christ, we can be confident that he's either going to walk us through it or he's going to calm it down. But when we start to get overwhelmed by our own life, by this, because life is going to hit, storms are going to come. If, you don't, if you've never been there, just wait like a day. It happens. And anybody who's living in reality knows that's true. But we serve a miracle-working God. A miracle-working God that can either calm the storm or walk us over it. And if we flounder, because we often do, he's right there. And he'll lift us out. You know what happens next? He and Peter take a little saunter on the waves. They get into the boat. Because Peter... They get in the boat, and what happens? Once again, the storm abates. There's no storm that you can go through that Jesus can't take care of it. Amen. He, yeah. So maybe you find yourself today in the midst of a storm. With a group this size, I'm sure there's few that are, 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 are struggling in the midst of a storm. There's two examples of a God that never changes, whose power exceeds that of the natural world, and he wants to be. The, the question is, are you asking God, do you care? Because if you ask him, that's, that's, that's a legit question. You ask him that question, the answer is going to come back, do you believe? Who am I? God, do you care? That's the wrong question. The question is, who is he? But we asked him. I've got journals full of that same question. God, do you care? God, do you care? God, do you care? We're human. We get that. He often doesn't answer the question. He just shows up. And he asks us this question. Where is your faith? And I don't think that's a slap down question. It's not like, where's your faith? Psh! I think it's more of a question of, like, literally, where is it? Where are you putting your faith? In the natural or the super? I can grab a bucket, and I can start bailing if you want. That's, that's, I have, I have, Jesus, I, that's what you want. But if you really, really want to, you know, put your faith in me, you're going to see things that you've never seen before. Would you stand with me?